Now, in a moment or two, uh, Ms. Jeacock, uh, I shall invite Mary to uh, administer the, the oath. Um, but let me explain the arrangements to you. Uh, you're talking not just to the, uh, the audience that you see in front of you. Uh, th those in front of you are largely uh, people who are core participants or participants in the inquiry. Um, but we are open to the public more generally. Uh, those to your left are, are lawyers, uh, and at the back of the room uh, there may be representatives of the media from time to time. Uh, however, the larger audience is likely to be online watching uh, YouTube or live stream, uh, and that will probably number in uh, three figures. So th that's your audience. Uh, Mary, do you administer the, the oath before Miss Scott asks the questions? Please state your full name. My name is Rowena Mary Geacock. And repeat after me. I do solemnly, sincerely. I do solemnly, sincerely. And truly declare and affirm. And truly declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Um, I'm going to start with a, an overview of your career. So before you um, uh, worked at the Department of Health, you, you started your, your working life as a teacher, is that right? I did, that's right, in secondary education. And you then uh, obtained an MSc and then a PhD and worked for a time as a research assistant. That's right. And what broadly was your area of, of, of expertise? Uh, <laughs> well, microbiology generally, I suppose I would say, yes. Um, and... Uh, uh, then in 19, between 1995 and 1998, you were employed by the West Midlands Regional Health Authority uh, as an education and training officer. That's right, yes. Uh, and then from, from there in 1998, you moved to the Department of Health where you uh, undertook various team leader roles. That's right. Uh, and you remained at the Department of Health until you retired in, in January 2017. Correct. Now, I'm going to be asking you questions about two of your team leader roles at the Department of Health today. Uh, the first is uh, between late 2002 and mid-2004, when you were head of the CJD team. Um, and we'll come on to look at, um, uh, in a bit more detail, about some, some of the, um, what you were precisely doing at, at that stage. Uh, and is it right to understand that from mid-2004, uh, so following a divisional restructure, you became responsible for detection and diagnostics for infectious diseases? That, that's correct, yes. So that would have included, would it, VCJD? It would, yes. And other diseases, and others, yes. such as HIV and hepatitis? Uh, actually... Strangely enough, no, not particularly. Um, it was much more about tuberculosis. Um, we had more flexible working arrangements um, after mid-2004, um, so I, I concentrated on certain areas, really. Uh, uh, and then in 2008, either late 2008 or early 2009, you say in your witness statement you haven't been able to ascertain the precise date, you moved to become head of blood policy. That's right. Uh, and you took over that role from William C Conan. Yes, William Conan. Yeah. Conan, thank you. Um, and then you also explained that in the summer of 2016, you took over the environmental hazards work of the branch, relinquishing your role as head of blood policy. Yes, um, I'm not quite sure of the date. It was probably spring or early summer of 2016. But you also tell us in your witness statement that while you had moved on to another mm. role when asked to help out by your colleagues yes. in the blood policy unit, yes. you, you would provide help if you could. I, I certainly did, yes. We were still working very flexibly, obviously, at that time. Uh, and the environmental hazards work, does that have any relevance to the matters that this inquiry is concerned none, with? None at all, no. Um, uh, just before we go on and ask you, I'll ask you about in a bit more detail about 
your, your actions and so on and what was happening at, at, during that, that period. Y you've told us um, in your witness statement that you have only a, a limited and usually very general recollection of events. Is that right? I think for the most part, yeah, yes. There are some things that obviously I do remember in more detail. And you also tell us in your witness statement that, that while you have been supplied with documents to prompt your memory and help you answer, uh, to answer the questions that you were asked, um, you have not been supplied with a full set of documents, particularly in relation from the period 2013 onwards because of the way that they were stored on the database and so yes, on. Yes, that's right. I mean, there are a great many documents that I know I haven't seen. Uh, and it's also right to point out that you've been provided with a number of documents by the inquiry in the last couple of weeks, um, two weeks ago and a week ago, um, in particular documents relevant to your role in responding to Lord Archer's report. That's right. Now, I'm going to be asking you some uh, more detailed questions about that than were asked of you in the Rule 9 request. Uh, and uh, your concern to let the inquiry know, is this right, that there are likely to be underlying documents from that time that you have not seen, you haven't yes. been provided with. That's correct. And so there may be gaps in your knowledge and difficulties in answering some of the questions that I asked. Yes, yes, that's, that's certainly true. Uh, well, we'll see, we'll see how we go. Um, and um, it, 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 there's always an opportunity to um, come back with another statement, yes. having seen further documents if necessary. So turning then to your role as head of the CJD team, again just reminding everyone of the dates, that was in 2002 yes. until 2008 when you moved to the Blood Policy Unit. Um, yes, that's true. I was head of CJD from actually, I think it was early 2002 until about mid-2004, and then I carried on working on C some aspects of CJD until late 2008. So, so is it right to, is that, is that because the CJD unit was disbanded in 2004 after the restructuring? Yes, yes, we didn't have a dedicated CJD team. We, we, we had fewer staff and therefore uh, worked more flexibly than we had done previously. Uh, and just to understand uh, who else was, was working in that area over that period, the head of division was David Harper initially, was it, and then Gerard Hetherington? Yes, uh, I think that's right. Um, certainly, I think actually Gerard Hetherington was, and I may not have put this in my statement, I think he might have been preceded by Mary O'Mahony. Um, David was promoted, um, and as I remember... Um, the divisional head was initially Mary O'Mahony um, and then Gerard Hetherington, I think. How large was the, t the CJD team when it existed, so between 2002 and 2004? Um, well, it existed prior to 2002, um, and I think when I took it over, I probably had about seven members of staff. I think there were about eight of us. So it was... It was a reasonably sized team in relation to a number of other teams, uh, you know, working in our sort of uh, vicinity. We've heard evidence from Charles Lister, for example, that the blood policy team at the time that he was heading it up was extremely stretched. Yes. Was that your experience for the CJD team? Mm, we, we were certainly very pressurised at times. Um, but uh, I think we were reasonably well resourced compared to other teams. Um, you say in your in your witness statement that your that the remit of the team was to ensure that advice to ministers on public health policy decisions regarding the transmission of spongiform enc encephalopathies, including CJD was based on expert scientific advice. That's right. So is it right to understand that the remit was, was really a, a feeding, a, obtaining information and feeding that on to, to the relevant, relevant people? That was part of it, but actually we had a, a policy development role. So obviously obtaining the scientific advice 
the, the modelling um, input, the uh, input from epidemiological experts and so on, was, was all part of it, but that actually helped to inform policy development. Um, and clearly we wouldn't do that in isolation. Um, that was very much done in conjunction with um, steers from our senior colleagues. And were you working on policy development with other units and, and other departments? Or? Certainly with other departments, yes. Um, we, we liaised very closely with um, DEFRA, so that's uh, the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, and the Food Standards Agency. Um, we were the three departments um, all advised by SEAC, so I think you know that's the spongiform encephalopathy advisory committee. We all contributed to the secretariat of SEAC and we all worked fairly closely together on a number of issues. And there were other, other um, parts of the department, for example, um, the medicines control agency as it was then um, that we uh, liaised with quite closely and other teams in the department. Now, you tell us in your statement that the reporting line to ministers during this time, mm. although you said it changes, changed later, was, was via the CMO, who was Sir Ian Donaldson. Yeah, that's my recollection. So d does that mean that, that, that you would report to the CMO and the CMO would report to ministers? Sometimes that, that would have been the case, um, but we would um, sometimes report to ministers, but everything would go through the CMO. Um, I'm, I'm just going to put up a, a section of your witness statement just to uh, get a flavour of, of, of the kind of information that you were reporting on. Could we have, please, WITN 0823003. This is your third witness statement. And it's page 80, please. And you say at the bottom there, paragraph 77.4... At the time that I was responsible for the CJD policy team, Professor Sir Liam Donaldson and his Deputy Chief Medical Officer, Dr Pat Troop, were very concerned about VCJD. We were expected to keep them informed on all aspects, including scientific advice sought and received, risk assessments and risk management options, advice to ministers, and plans for communication with medical professionals and the public. And then you go on to say that Sir Liam had his own website and sought material from the policy team to inform updates on the website. And by the policy team, do you mean the CJD team? I, I mean team? the CJD team, yes. Um, and you've told us in your witness statement, and I don't think we need to go to this, but you drew on a number of sources. We had a number of sources of information. Um, you had the uh, CJD Research and Surveillance Unit. Yes. Uh, you had the UK Blood Services. You had the Health Protection Agency, um, and you had other expert committees, including the Advisory Committee on the Dangerous Pathogens. You've already mentioned SIAC, uh, the CJD Incident Panel, um, and the MSBT, which later became SABTO. That's right, yes. And so you had relationships, did you, with people in all of those organisations and committees and so on, and were, had a, free, a, a yes. flow of information between them? That's right. Uh, and you've already mentioned that you were part of the Secretariat with SEAT, shared with other colleagues. Um, <clears throat> and we can see from documents you attending meetings of, for example, SEAC, for example, the CJD mm -hmm. Incident Panel. Um, again, was that to obtain information in order to be able to brief the CMO and ministers about risks and so on? It was, it was uh, the CJD Incidents Panel was actually set up um, to advise the NHS on um, actions that needed to be taken in relation to um, um, medical incidents that had happened uh, re relating to patients who either had been diagnosed with CJD or were um, subsequently found to uh, or thought to be at risk of, of C CJD. So, um, but, but clearly the advice that the panel provided was communicated to senior colleagues in the office. Uh, and the sorts of uh, I information then you would be given, be, gi be passing up, and we can see this from the papers, is, for example, when uh, 
a new case of VCJD is identified um, uh, and the actions at the blood services and so on taken in response to that. Is that those pieces of information, key, key events yes. that change the risk that are, that are passed up yes. through the line. Yes. Um, what what um, policy decisions fell within your remit, but, uh, either when the CJD team was in existence or, or later when you were, uh, after the, after the reorganisation in, in 2004? Well, I think anything relating to variant CJD, uh, certainly while I was head of the CJD team, would have fallen within my, my broad remit. I mean, obviously, sometimes in association with other colleagues. Um, so, for example, if it had an impact on um, medicines, um, there, was, uh, there was, I remember um, at the time, quite a lot of concern about um, the use of bovine products in medicines and therapeutics, so things like collagen or gelatin um, or albumin. So um, obviously that cut across uh, the medical control, uh, the medicines control agency um, area. So sometimes I worked closely with those other, um, other organisations or parts of the department. And, and how about decisions in relation to the safety of the blood supply? Would that come arising from VCJD, CJD, would that fall under your remit or under the remit of the blood policy unit? Um, I think we provided, um, my team in CJD provided advice on CJD risks, but we wouldn't have done that in isolation from the blood policy team. So we would have kept them cited on um, any of our work that impacted on their area of policy, just as they would have kept us cited uh, it, you know, in turn. Uh, and it, so when you moved to the blood policy unit in 2008, is it right to understand that you retained a, um, a role in policy development for, for VCJD? To some extent, yes. Um, our CJD policy lead at that time actually reported to me, so I was his line manager. But I remember that most of the work that he did on CJD, I was certainly kept aware of it, but most of that was done in conjunction with the branch head, Dr. Elsa White. But we, we did sometimes, again, there was some flexibility required depending on what else was happening, so sometimes I was perhaps more um, involved than at other times. We can see from the documents, and you've referred to some of these in your statement, I don't think we need to go to them, but before 2008, we can see you liaising with the Foreign Commonwealth Office, mm -hmm. um, foreign governments, mm -hmm. Uh, sharing information about VCJD, about developments in the UK. Um, was that part of your role as yes, head of the yes, unit? Yes, it, it was. It was an important part of um, my role. Um, obviously, in terms of um, the scientific uh, contacts, um, the surveillance, for example, the um, National CJD Surveillance Unit in Edinburgh would have been the main point of contact with their counterparts in other countries. But um, the Department of Health here was uh, the main point, point of contact with health ministries in other countries. So that was done through my team. Um, and presumably you would have expected to receive information the other way, yes. where relevant. Yes, yes. Um, now, you told us already about your uh, responsibility for delivering the secretariat function to um, SIAC. Um, it, it, it's right, is it, that from 2005 you took on the responsibility for delivering the secretariat function to the MSBT, the, the Committee for the Microbiological Safety of Blood uh, and Tissue? I don't think that's quite right. Um, I don't think I ever actually provided the secretariat, as far as I remember. That was located in the blood team, the blood policy team, but I did assist them, and I did a great deal of work with 
the, the MSBT and, as you say, its successors. Uh, and uh, is this right? Were you also the Secretariat for the CJD Therapy Advisory Group? Yes, uh, the CJD team provided the Secretariat for that uh, time-limited group. Uh, and are you able to uh, give us any information about how appointments were made to those committees during your time? Committee appointments were done through open competition. Um, things had changed, I believe, uh, in terms of scientific committee advice very much since the publication of the Phillips Report on BSE, the BSE Inquiry Report, um, when one of the recommendations of Lord Phillips was very much that um, scientific advisory committees should offer scientific advice but should not be um, involved in policy decisions. So um, we, we tried to, to make sure we had a much clearer demarcation line um, and that was made very clear to um, uh, people who applied for roles on scientific advisory committees. Um, we also used the Nolan principles. I believe they had been in use beforehand, but um, they were very, I think more emphasis was perhaps given to them um, in terms of making appointments to those committees. So in terms of there being a, an open competition, does that mean that people were not invited to sit on the committees? That they excuse me, um, ad adverts effectively went out? I think, for the most part, adverts were sent out, yes. Um, and, and then um, they were appointed, use, appointed by independent... There was a, yes, there was a panel um, uh, that interviewed the applicants. There was always an independent assessor on the panel... Um, so that things were done, to make sure that things were done properly and fairly. And, and to what extent, I mean, you, don't, you, may not be able to, uh, you may not be able to answer this, but to what extent did the Department of Health or the CMO or, um, have a role in ensuring that there was a wide range of voices represented on any particular committee? We would try to do that in terms of partly the spectrum of, of advice that we felt we needed, so the, the types of expertise that, that we wanted. But I know um, Sir Liam was particularly concerned to make sure that we had um, a wide spectrum of scientific opinion on our committees um, so that there would be challenge within the committees. So we endeavoured um, to do that as far as possible and not to appoint people who all took the same perspective, perhaps scientific perspective. And uh, what was the practice uh, 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 during your, your tenure in terms of publishing minutes or, or publishing advice given to, to these committees? That was something else that I think really emanated from um, the BSE inquiry report that um, a, a recommendation that communication of scientific uncertainty, because clearly there was a lot of scientific uncertainty, <coughs> excuse me, associated with um, BSC and, and obviously um, variant CJD, um, that it was very important to, to try to communicate that uncertainty as well as possible to the public, and also to improve public communications on understanding risk. Um, so one of the ways that we did that was by trying to make sure that our scientific advisory committee meetings were as accessible as possible to anyone who was interested. Um, generally, that involved publishing the minutes, um, following the meetings, and certainly some of our committees had open meetings. SEAC actually, every single meeting, I think from about 2003 onwards, they had an open session that was open to the public. I think it was filmed for the internet as well, for people who couldn't get there in person. Um, so we, we tried to um, make sure that advice was accessible. And, and so we can see from, from the papers that in terms of minutes from, uh, of these meetings, there's a, a minute which lists those that are present and mm -hmm. lists the discussion in, in the usual way, yes. actions and so on. And then quite often there's also a 
a, a, a published report, if you like, of the, of the meeting. It yes. doesn't set out the same That's detail. Right. Is that so that you're, you're, you're trying to create, strike a balance between sharing information but also allowing the committee to have debate in, in yes. private? Yes, very much so. So, I mean, you wouldn't publish committee meet, minutes verbatim. Um, it was important that uh, the experts could have a, a, a robust discussion uh, in private, but nevertheless, the minutes um, as published would capture um, the key points that were made in the discussion and ultimately the view that the committee came to, um, assuming they came to a view, and sometimes, of course, they didn't. They weren't able to come to a view. And was the, as a matter of generality, was the principle that the published minutes should um, uh, capture the, the, the range of opinion, not necessarily yes. attributing it to anybody, but yes. that there was a dispute or there was a range, even if the committee came to or didn't come to a particular view. Yes, that's right. It, it, we, we tried very hard to capture that range of opinion. I'm going to ask you just a, a very, um, very briefly about the notification process uh, for, uh, and by that I mean the process that was undertaken uh, by the Department of Health, led by the Health Protection Agency, uh, beginning in December 2003 and mm -hmm. then um, at various intervals in, mm -hmm. in, the, in the remaining years, to notify those that had been, uh, had had blood products or, 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 or blood transfusions that they were at, at risk for VCJD for public health purposes. Um, I just want to pick up one aspect of mm. that with you that you re refer to in your witness statement. Um, you, you refer in your witness statement to discussions at the CJD incident panel it, it between, uh, during their, their meetings in May and September 2004, in which there are discussions about the importance of access for patients who are being notified mm. to appropriately trained healthcare service staff to counsel them on the implications of being notified. Yes. Do you recall those? Do you have an independent recollection of those discussions? I can't say that I do. Um, I, I, I was just aware once I saw the, the minutes of those panel meetings. Um, uh, and what you say in your witness statement is that your recollection is that following the September 2004 meeting, you phoned Professor Gill at the Health Protection Agency and asked him whether or not uh, patients would indeed have ac access to an expert counsellor and whether that was being provided to all patients. Yes. Again, is that, that something you re re recollect? Mm, I, I must admit, I don't recollect that, no. I saw that again in some of the documentation that was provided. So does it follow that you, you don't recollect what, was, what Professor Gill told I, you? I'm afraid I don't recollect that, no. I'm going to move um, on now to your role um, as Head of Blood Policy um, from the end of 2008, possibly beginning of mm -hmm. 2009, until spring, summer of 2016. Um, is it right that the Blood Policy Unit along with the, with the CJD unit and the role that you were in once the CJD unit had been disbanded, all sat within the Health Protection Division of the Department of Health. That's right, yes, yes. Um, uh, and that uh, certainly by, in your role as, uh, as head of blood policy, it may be the case before that as well, but you reported to Dr Ailsa White, who's the Deputy Director of Health Protection. That's right. Um, and, um, and then... The Director of Health Protection, you've told us about David Harper and, uh, and Gerald Hetherington, and then uh, um, succeeding him, Elizabeth Wooderson. Clara Swinson first. Clara Swinson first, yes. then Elizabeth then Wooderson. Then Elizabeth Wooderson. Then Helen Shirley Quick. That's right, yes. Um, and you mentioned already uh, David Harper being um, promoted. He was promoted, is that right, to Director General yes. of Health? Yes, yes. Uh, and he was succeeded in 2012 by Dr Felicity Harvey. That's right. Um, 
in broad terms, the, the blood policy unit w was responsible for policy on, on blood safety, is that right, and supply? Yes, uh, certainly when I, uh, when I started it was responsible for blood safety and supply. The supply aspect, um, which was really the sponsorship of NHSBT, um, transferred uh, to another team, I think it was at the end of 2012. Um, so just picking up then on, on the sponsorship aspect of your role, for, for, first of all, for NHSBT, as you say, in your witness statement, you say 2008 to, to about 2012. Um, what, what in practice did that mean? It, it meant that uh, my team was responsible for the day-to-day -day management of any business that involved NHSBT, fundamentally, um, and also responsible for um, their uh, annual accountability reviews. So it covered a very wide range of work. And you describe having regular meetings with them? Yes. Um, and uh, sitting together with, with mem members of either you or your team sitting on similar um, committees to uh, people from the NHSBT? The NHSBT, um, and in fact the UK Blood Services as a whole, um, members of those organisations were very important, uh, made a very important contribution as members of some of our advisory committees. Uh, and, and you say that, that you were responsible for holding the NHSBT to account yes. for the effective delivery of its executive functions within its financial allocation. Yes, that that's broadly uh, broadly describes it correctly. Yes, so, uh, uh, making sure it, it did what it did well right. within the money yes. it had been given. That's right. Um, you also, is this right, had responsibility initially, anyway, at least, for the policy for the trusts and schemes or the Alliance House organisations. So by that I mean in 2008, in any event, McFarlane Trust, Eileen Trust, no. and Skipton, Skipton Fund. No, no, I had no policy responsibility for those or no sponsorship responsibility for those until the end of 2011. So um, those organisations were, their, their sort of business, if you like, was um, overseen by um, Jonathan Stopes Rowe, who was another deputy director, and um, one of the teams in his branch. One of the, the letters, and I can, we can go to it in a minute if, if it helps, but one of the letters suggests that, that policy was within your team and sponsorship was within Jonathan Stokes' yes. row team, and then the two came together yes. in, in, in 2011. Policy for, if you like, the historical infect, in, historically infected blood was within my team, but those payment schemes were not within my purview until late 2011. So that, that explains, does it, why matters such as response to the Archer inquiry fell to you? Yes, that's right. Um, so I would lead, my team would lead on that and pull together input and contributions from anyone else across the department and outside the department indeed who had an interest. But the day-to-day -day policy decisions such as they were that needed to be made by the Department of Health about McFarland Trust, about Eileen Trust was not in your department until 2011? No, that's right. Um, I'm going to come and look at, in a moment um, at your role in the response to the um, Archer report. <clears throat> Before I do, I just want to get a sort of broader view about the, what was going on generally in the government at the time uh, in terms of ministerial turnover. Um, when you arrived in 2008-2009, is it right that the Minister of State for Public Health, Dawn Primarolo, was the minister, your, your sort of that's first right. port of call yes, that's in the ministerial right. team? And then she was replaced in June 2009 by Gillian Merrin. That's... Uh was it June 2009 or was it June 2010? I've forgotten, I'm sorry. 
I think I should know this. I think it's 2009, but I will... No, you may, you may well be right. I'm sorry, I've forgotten as well. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure I think it is 2009. Um, uh, yes, it is 2009. Fine, yes. Uh, yeah. Um, and then in May 2010, so just a year, just under a year afterwards, um, there's a, a general election. That's right. Change of government. That's right. So Labour out, Conservatives in, mm -hmm. and we have Anne Milton taking over as uh, uh, Parliamentary Under Secretary for Public Health. That's correct. So it moves at that stage from the Minister of State for Public Health responsibility, yes. primary responsibility, if I can put it that way, to Parliamentary uh, Under Secretary for Public Health. Do we read anything into that, that there's a change of, of no, seniority? In no, I don't think so. I think those are just decisions for ministers and how they want to organise their uh, ministerial responsibilities and portfolios. I'm, I'm certainly not aware of uh, in, that anything should be read into that. And then um, Anne Milton is in post from May 2010 until September 2012 when Anna Soubry takes over. That's right. Uh, and then in October 2013, so just over a year later, Jane Ellison takes over. That's right. Uh, and then um, we have Jane Ellison in post until July 2016 when David Mowat takes over. But yes, by that stage I really didn't have any contact with Ministers on Blood, so Jane Ellison is the last Minister that I, I remember working with. Uh, and then in terms of the Secretary of State, we have two Secretary of States under the Labour government. We have Alan Johnson, first of all, uh, in, yes. during your time, and That's then right. Andy Burnham. Yes. Uh, and then under the Conservative government, we have first of all Andrew Lansley, and then he's succeeded by Jeremy Hunt. That's right. So during your time on the Blood Policy Unit, there were six junior ministers and four Secretary of State in eight years. Um, what were the advantages at, and or disadvantages of that level of change in, 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 minister, in ministers? Clearly... An advantage um, is that sometimes you get a, French, a fresh perspective on things. Um, a disadvantage is also with a complex policy area, bringing ministers up to speed again. I mean, it's obviously difficult for them um, to take on a whole new portfolio and perhaps only have it for a very short period of time. Um, but bringing ministers up to speed so that they they had as good an understanding as we were able to help them with of the whole spectrum of, of the issues. I mean, clearly that was sometimes a little bit um, of a problem. Uh, and how easy is it to get business done if you've got a change of leadership so frequently? It does impact on the speed of business decisions. There is no doubt about that. Um, sometimes new ministers want to take some time to get to grips with something before they come to any sort of substantive decision. So yes, it, it, it can impact uh, on the, the speed at, at which we're able to get business done. And presumably also, as you say, you've got a fresh pair of eyes coming in, mm. so you don't know whether or not they're going to want to change tack. So you no. could be doing a lot of work, a new minister comes in, that's undone because they take a different view. Yes, yes. I mean, uh, and, you know, that's the nature of, uh, I suppose, a civil servant's job. You have to be able, ready and able to respond to different requirements from different ministers and also, of course, different governments. Does, does that, 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 that sort of high turnover... Um, mean that there is a, a, I don't know if higher burden is the right, right way to describe it, but there we go, those, those are the words I've chosen, higher burden on civil servants to make sure that the briefings and the submissions and so on that they give to ministers are, are accurate and balanced, giving the, the minister the full picture because the minister will not have any historic knowledge of what's gone before. No, that's right. The minister does would, wouldn't or probably wouldn't have uh, historic knowledge, although they may obviously... Uh, and subsequent ministers certainly did after there was so much parliamentary interest in infected blood. Um, they, they came in with, I think, their own perspective of what they'd heard uh, in the House. 
Um, but yes, I think it, it does put, if you like, a higher burden on uh, teams briefing um, and, and having to brief very, very quickly sometimes too. And, and the way this was put to Lord Waldegrave was, 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 does that mean that the civil service effectively hold the corporate memory of the department? I would say that is probably the correct way of putting it, yes. Uh, and presumably that corporate memory comes from the knowledge of the civil servants and the documentation, submissions, yes. reports, yes. research that's been done by their predecessors. Yes, that's right. So moving then on then to the response to the um, Archer report, uh, as we established, the, the minister primarily concerned with that, at least at the, the, the first instance, was, was, was the Minister of State for Public Health, Dawn Primarolo. Um, now, is, is it right to understand from your witness statement that, that this issue was really the first issue that you had to deal with the in first, terms of blood policy in yes, your new I, role? As I remember it, it was the first substantive issue that I, I had to deal with, yes. Um, uh, uh, and um, we know that the um, report was published on the 23rd of February 2009. Mm. Did you have, or did the department have, any advanced uh, copy of that report? No, no, we didn't. Um, sometimes, um, I, I remember from sort of previous experience, um, reports on various matters would be shared with the department in advance of publication, but this one wasn't. So just sort of casting your mm. mind back then, the report is published on 23rd of February 2009. Is it right that really you didn't know very much about this area at that stage and you had to not only get yourself up to speed but also the minister up to speed about, about how to respond? Yes, that's true to some extent. I mean, obviously, I knew something about the area because I had been briefed by William Connan, my predecessor, and I had been aware of some of the work that was going on in the branch generally because, obviously, we were in the same branch. Um, so I was aware of um, some of the other work that was going on, and I, uh, I knew of um, Lord Archer's uh, inquiry. Um, what I don't remember is or ever being aware of is what um, the minister may have been aware of before. I, I don't recollect seeing any submissions to her from my predecessor um, in advance of me briefing her. And, and that is, um, are, are you saying that you don't, you don't think at the time you saw those or subsequently you haven't seen them? No, I don't. Well, I, subsequently, actually, I haven't seen them. Um, I certainly don't remember having seen them. Um, and at the time, um, no, I don't have any recollection of seeing them. I think I was orally briefed. Um, that's all I remember. I'm going to look, turn up the the, the, sub, the recommendation from hmm. uh, Lord the recommendations from Lord Archer's report. I'm really going to focus my questions on one recommendation, but just so that we that, that everybody has uh, the context in which these questions are being asked. So could we have please A R C H six zeros one. So this is um, Lord Archer's report, report, and I think the recommendations, I think, start at on 107, or it could be 108. I'm not sure electronically. I think it might be 108, actually. Yes. Um, so um, Lord Archer sets out a number of recommendations uh, about a committee being established to advise government on the management of haemophilia, um, and then um, over the page, uh, two patients with haemophilia who have received blood products and their partners being tested for any condition identified by that committee and um, recommendations similarly in relation to blood donors at paragraph three. Um, and then the recommendation that we heard a, a little bit about yesterday 
uh, that those who had been infected should be issued with cards entitling the holder to benefits not freely available under the NHS, including in a range of um, uh, services set out. Um, uh, paragraph 5 relates to the, the, the future securing of the funding of the Haemophilia Society. And then it's paragraph 6 that I'm going to focus my questions on. Direct fi financial relief should be provided for those infected and for carers who have been prevented from working. We propose that the scheme should have the following characteristics. Uh, first of all, A, it should be paid through the Department of Work and Pensions in the same way as existing statutory benefits, uh, so that the benef beneficiaries should receive their entitlements from the government and not through intermediate sources such as the McFarlane or Eileen Trusts or the Skipton Fund. The government would thus have direct responsibility to the individual beneficiary for providing the necessary resources. Entitlements should be payable if infection is established within the appropriate time frame, and then it goes on to talk about an appeal mechanism. C, entitlement should not be means tested, but should take the form of an initial capital sum, followed by prescribed periodical payments. D, there should be no distinctions dependent upon the reason for the treatment with blood or blood products. E, the anomalies which at present apply according to the age when the recipient was first infected or when the infection took place, or in the case of dependence, the date of death of the original patient should be rectified. In particular, the government should review the conditions under which the widow of a patient infected by blood products now becomes eligible for benefit from the Eileen Trust and from the Skipton Fund. F. Payments under the scheme should be disregarded for the purposes of calculating other benefits. G. There should be a table of amounts payable in the case of double or multiple infections. And then over the page. H. We suggest that payments should be at least the equivalent of those payable under the scheme, which applies at any time in Ireland. And then a recommendation seven it relates to the provision of access to insurance for those that are infected. Um, and um, eight uh, relates to um, a uh, recommendation that there should be a look back exercise to identify those who have been unknowingly infected. So that's just to put the context of the, these questions in, in, into context. Um, before we look at any of the documents, can you just give us an idea of the process that, that you went through, or if you can't remember exactly, you think you would have gone through? Um, new in the job, this is the first time an issue to do with this comes across your desk. How would you have gone about, or how did you go about preparing a, sub a submission for the minister? Uh, well, I didn't actually... Um see the report in advance, as I said. Um, clearly, when I read the recommendations, um, I realized they were incredibly wide-ranging and were going to need input from um, a number of different sources, that's policy teams within the department, but clearly also discussion with DWP, for example, um, on the recommendation that, that they should be the um, distributor, if you like, of uh, financial payments. Um, so, uh, I initially put up a very quick submission to say, uh, really, that, and to say this is going to take a little bit of time to consider the response. Um, I actually recommended that, you know, it might take as long as, uh, or suggested that it might take as long as three months um, to be able to gather all the information and make decisions about the, the response. Um, I... Um, so th that was a sort of an initial, perhaps it's, I shouldn't describe it as quick and dirty, but I think it probably was quick and dirty um, note just to appraise the minister uh, of broadly uh, what the report was and how we were proposing to, um, to deal with it. Um, but it became very apparent that she wanted much more substantial advice and she wanted it very quickly. So then we go into the sequence of... Um, following um, submissions and advice that I think you're probably going to ask me about. I am, and we'll go to those documents um, in a moment and have a, look, have a look at the detail of it. But just as a matter of generality then, how, 
how would you go about, what would be the actual process of going about trying to educate yourself about the history, about what you should be telling the minister, about the, the, the risks, the, the, the arguments, the position, etc.? So, discussion obviously with my branch head probably would have been first and foremost because she was much more familiar um, with the, the, the set of issues than I was. Um, but obviously using um, existing briefings. And as I said to you a little while ago, I do not remember seeing a briefing or a submission, shall we say, to the minister from Mr. Conan. I suspect that that may well be because um, his last briefing to her may well have been very early in the inquiry process and therefore of not much help, if you like, uh, in terms of uh, looking now at what Lord Archer was recommending. Uh, uh, the inquiry has provided you with two pieces of work that were published by the Department of Health before you arrived yes. at the Blood Policy Unit. Yes. We don't need to look at them, but just so... Uh, and we've looked at them all, uh, in past hearings, and I'm, I'm sure we'll look at them again in, in, in other um, uh, hearings. Um, the first one is the review of documentation relating to the safety of blood products, 1970 to 1985, non-A, non-B hepatitis, That's right. published in May 2007. And I'll give the, tran uh, the, the, the reference for the transcript. PRSE uh, 40642. And then the self-sufficiency chronology. So self-sufficiency in blood products in England and Wales, a chronology from 1973 to 1991, DHSC 02000111. We don't need to put that up on the, on the, on the uh, screen. So the, 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 um, you've been you've provide, provided with those documents from, from the inquiry. Um, first of all, is it right to understand that you didn't have anything to do with the authoring of those documents? No, that's correct. I was aware of them. Uh, and would those documents have been the sorts of documents, you said you'd go to other submissions, but would you have gone to sort of set pieces, if yes. I can put it like that? Yes, uh, most certainly they would have been, um, I would have considered those important sources of um, information. So is it right to understand then you would have taken th those documents and any briefings that had been sent up to the minister as the starting position? That's right. That's and then you would have considered, well, what's come in, what's new that needs to be added yes. to those or, or, or puts those in a different light? And that would be the basis upon yes. which you would be a, a, yes. providing your, your advice. Um, and, and is it also right to understand that you, you, you wouldn't, looking at those those chronologies or those reports I've just mentioned or, or indeed the submissions from your colleagues go back and re-research what was in there. You would take that as, as read, as, as no, correct. That, that's correct. Um, so as you say, initially you did this, this, this piece of work. We, we can have a look at that. It's DHSC 0041157 underscore 057. So we, we can see here that this is, this is from you, dated the 24th of February, so that's the day after the report's published. It's um, uh, MSPH, so that's to uh, Minister of State for Public Health, Dawn Prebarolo. And we can see there it's cleared by Elsa White. Can you just explain to us what, what the clearing process means? It's, it's a quality control process um, that all submissions, certainly during my time in the department, all submissions to ministers um, were expected to be cleared by a member of the senior civil service. Uh, so it, it, it's a way of quality controlling, if you like, the, the accuracy and, and content of, of, and the advice, obviously, that's being given. And presumably the need to send anything to the minister at all. Yeah, yes, yes. That's um, right. I wouldn't send something off my own back, shall we say, without discussing it with my branch head. So we'll come back to look at the handwriting in a moment, but just to, to deal with, the, with, with, with what, what you have put there. Yes. The purpose is to inform you of the recommendations of the Archer report, which was published yesterday, and to give an initial view on actions needed before the government can respond. And then if we go down, we can see recommendation, uh, that you note the report's recommendations and agree to preparation of a government response. And then you set out the summary of Lord Archer's 
recommendations, which we don't need to go to because we've looked at them in the report. And then if we go over to page three, please. I think this is what you were mentioning, timetable for handling. We strongly recommend not making any immediate commitment to a timetable for a response. Our initial view is that the necessary consultation and costing of options plus decision time may require three months. Um, so then if we go back to page one and we just look at the handwriting on there, there's this handwriting there, it says, Dear Dawn, in terms of what would be reasonable to be given as a one-off additional payment to the funds for McFarlane, it would be seven and a half to eight million more than. Is it right to understand this is a handwritten note from uh, the uh, Assistant Private Secretary to the Minister? That's correct, yes. And uh, do you know where this figure of seven and a half to eight million came from so early on? No, I, I don't. I must admit, when I saw this particular copy of the submission, I too was um, somewhat surprised at that. I mean, she may have spoken to my colleagues uh, in finance. I really don't know. And then we've got other handwriting there, I, which I think says, I think this report is poor. I think see attached for note for further urgent action for decision. Um, and some scribbling out. Uh, 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 is that, as you understand it, uh, Dawn Primarolo's uh, that, that, that would be my interpretation, yes. Um, and then if we go over the page back, please, to page three, we can see, again, I, I, think, I think it's, from memory, is it Morvan Smith? Yes, that's yes. right, Morvan, Morvan Smith. Morvan Smith's yes. handwriting. Um, she says this, the government at the time, 1980s, did not accept that there was a case to be answered and did, did not accept blame. In Ireland, the government did accept blame and, blame and thus offered compensation. And I'm, I'm going to come on to ask you some questions about the um, department's um, uh, view about the difference between England and Ireland in, mm. in due course. Uh, response to this report does not intend to revisit decisions not to, ac to not accept blame. I asked officials about reasons why the government of the day did not accept blame. No information about this is held. And then officials are seeking legal advice on how apologising and using the terms health disaster might affect us. Now, it's really just in response to that second uh, starred point there. Do you recall having any discussion yourself about this with Ms Smith? I don't actually recollect any discussion. Do you know what she's talking about there when she says the government does not, holds no information about uh, why the government of the day didn't accept blame? No, I, I don't personally know what, what she might have meant by that or where that, um, what informed that comment of hers. Uh, uh, you've uh, mentioned the response to that from the uh, minister. I think it's probably worth just having a look at that. If we could par uh, turn, please, to DHSC 0011469. That may be that this is the urgent action um, referred to by, by the minister in her handwritten bit, but it may not be. If we, I think this is an email chain, so we need to start yes. this at the, at the back of the... Um, uh, of the document. So could we start, please, at page nine, please? Which is, I think, the, the start of the, the last, the first email in time. So we look at the bottom there. We've got Morvan Smith to uh, Rowena Jaycock and then a number of other people on the 25th of February 2009. So that's the day after uh, you sent up that submission. And then if we go over, please, to page 10... We can say, uh, see what she says there. Dear all, thank you for your submission rega regarding the recent publication of Lord Archer's independent inquiry report. MSPH has seen this report and is very concerned about the contamination of NHS blood and blood products during the 70s and 80s. She is particularly concerned about how this issue has been handled. And we'll come to an email where she explains what yes, that means in yes. a moment. Uh, the Minister feels that it is clearly not acceptable in such tragic and unique circumstances 
for DH to claim no liability and to give no more money to the trusts. Uh, and then she has asked for the following work to be done uh, by 9am tomorrow morning. And she's asked for a list of ministers responsible for blood policy since 1970. Um, and uh, a contact has been made with the Cabinet Office. And then um, she sets out a, a long list of information that she seeks uh, by 9 o'clock the following morning, including, um, at, at paragraph 5, a brief note on the attitude of the government of the day to this issue, uh, paragraph 6, how to respond immediately to the request for an apology from victims, uh, 7, how much can we give to the Eileen and McFarlane Trust as an immediate amount of additional resource, um, 8, how to take forward uh, consideration of each recommendation of the report. She needs a more robust response than was given in the, go over the page, previous note. Um, uh, nine, what is in place so that this tragedy is never repeated? Um, and then uh, asking for a note, um, I think it, it says from MSPH, oh, and then yes. uh, drafting a note from her. We've got a bit of feedback here. Um, asking for a note for you, as I understand it, to draft a note from her to the Secretary of State um, on the issue and the proposed way forward. Um, but, uh, and she makes the point that she wants to put something in, in the Secretary of State's w weekend box, so needs it urgently. That's right. Um, so that's the email um, uh, that you receive on the 25th. Um, uh, and... Uh, uh, and then if we could look, please, at page seven. About an hour later, 13.34, at the bottom of that page, we've got another email from Morven Smith to you and others. And if we go over the page, she explains what she meant by the comment about concerns about how the matter's been handled. I apologise about the confusion over part of my initial email, I did not mean to imply that the Minister was un unhappy about the team's handling of the publication of Lord Archer's report. I was referring to the handling of the issue as whole in an historical context, as well as how we came to the position we are at now, particularly with re reference to our position regarding a public inquiry. Uh, I, then we can see your response to that email, which is at DHSC... 001467. Um, again, from you to uh, Minister of State for Public Health. Um, we just look at the, the beginning of this paragraph one. The report of Lord Archer's independent inquiry, uh, published on 23rd of February, is critical of the speed of the response of the NHS and government to threats of contamination of blood and blood products with HIV and hepatitis C in the 1970s and 80s. We do not accept all his criticisms, but official documents do show problems at various times in the development of UK capabilities for manufacture of blood products. And then you go on to talk about the um, 2001 Consumer Protection Act judgment from uh, Mr Justice Burton um, and making the point that he, he found that the UK could have introduced screening or surrogate tests for hepatitis C earlier than it did. Um, and then um, you uh, set out um, uh, some of the information that the Minister has asked for, and you make the point at paragraph 5 that, um, if we go over the page, that you're consulting widely across the department to collect the necessary information to enable a consideration of all the recommendations in Lord Archer's report. We can move quickly to set out the options when you've had an opportunity to discuss 
the initial response with the Secretary of State. Um, and she's asked particularly for, um, you, you provide her with a chronology of relevant events, um, details of payments that have already been made to um, the trust, to, to the McFarland Trust and Eileen Trust and so on, and a history of, 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 of the payments that are currently being made um, and uh, various other historical information. Is it right to understand that, that, that at this stage you're getting a pretty strong steer from the, from the minister? Indeed. Um, that, that, that this for her is an, important, an important, important matter and she wants to really be able to make progress, first of all on the recommendations, but also on matters like making an apology and providing more, more, more money for the trust and Yes, schemes. that's right. Uh, she's asking you to do an awful lot of work in, in a short amount of time. Uh, how realistic was that? Well, when a minister asks, you do your very best. Um, and we, or I and my colleagues, did our very best to pull together whatever we could um, to, to try and uh, deal with her queries. Um, by I think we made it by 9.30 the following morning, actually. I don't think we quite made the 9 o'clock deadline. Um, but yes, uh, I mean, I, I think I had already commissioned, I can't remember, I think it might have been the day before I had already commissioned um, input from colleagues elsewhere in the department whose policy areas were um, impacted by the recommendations. Um, and, and as I say, the, the team uh, helped me. We put a lot of information together in a very short period of time. Uh, and we, I'm not, not going to go to it now, but the, the document we looked at, the email chain, which we looked at earlier, just read transcript, a uh, reference into the transcript, DHSC 0011469, shows a further email exchange after receipt of this, mm -hmm. um, uh, this, this, this uh, submission uh, that we just looked at of, of the 26th of February from Morven Smith asking for more information, yes. and then an hour later, yes. uh, a list of, of more information yes. that, that Dawn Primarolo wants you to yes. look at, uh, again, with, with, with short time frames. I mean, I think that's not, it's not perhaps unusual, although I must admit in this particular circumstance it was difficult, but it's an, an assistant private secretary will read the submission ahead of actually passing it to the minister, and if the assistant private secretary identifies things that they think their minister will want more information about, then they will try and commission it early. And then obviously the minister subsequently has questions, so. And is this sort of toing and froing between civil servants and ministers, is that par for the course, or, or was this an unusual interaction in your I experience? I think, in my experience, this was unusual. Um, I don't <sighs> recollect coming across it before in quite this way, no. Um, I'm not saying it doesn't happen elsewhere. I'm sure it does. I'm sure it has happened. But uh, this was my first experience of this kind of interaction. And, and what did you take from, from that? Well, that we, I have to say, I was concerned that we were not uh, appearing to be able to give the minister what she wanted. Um, we, I felt um, that I was having some difficulty understanding what I could provide to her that would actually satisfy her. Um, and we, I mean, again, we'll see some subsequent submissions which I think illustrate the difficulty that we had in actually providing the minister with something that she was happy with. And I think it also perhaps demonstrates that her understanding of what could be done changed over time as well. Uh now, I want to move to a new document, which may take me a little more than four minutes, which is when I would usually ask for the mid-morning break. I wonder whether we should break a little bit early. Uh, yes, we're, we're, we can do that. Um, so let's uh, take a, a break uh, now uh, until 20 to 12. Um, this is the, the first break. Uh, it, at this break and at any other break, uh, you you are under oath, you must not discuss your evidence with anyone, whoever that anyone is, but you can talk about anything else you like. Thank you. <laughs> 20 to 12.